Hello, this is Professor Leonard. This is English 810, uh, Lecture 1, which is an introduction to 20th century and some 21st century uh, literature and film. So I've posted uh, Lecture 1 as, as a written text in the discussions section of Quirkus, and I, I'll be reading a little from that, and, and I'll be riffing off of my own reading. So this lecture plus that text taken together um, should give you a fairly three-dimensional sense of what I'm talking about. Um, and you can do any number of things. You can listen to this lecture first, then read the text. You can read the text and then listen to the lecture. You can go back and forth. I think you can, uh, I'm going to allow it to, to be downloadable, I think, the lecture, if I can figure it out. The, the text is certainly downloadable. I deliberately put the lecture text under discussions because that makes it quite easy for you guys to comment. Um, you can comment on the this tape lecture on, in the same in that same section. Ask questions, comment. Um, feel free to comment on, on other student comments. I, I will monitor it. I will look at it and I will jump in from time to time and uh, offer make a contribution. So it, it'll be a kind of ongoing open format. This is so-called asynchronous class. Um, so you, this lecture is recorded and you can listen to it whenever. But I will be holding what I'm going to just what I guess I will call an open classroom once a week. The I think that the moment the plan is Wednesday at 11 in the morning and we can record that too. But it's I don't see it as a um, part of as a required uh, part of things uh, because I'm not going to show up for the lecture. I'm there to answer questions um, and comment further. And and they can be practical questions about like to do all this Zoom stuff. Um, uh, and they can be much more specific questions. And but I'm going to open the room so it'll be every anyone who comes in the room. Uh, so it'll be kind of a mass office hour. If, if for some reason you need to send me something and and you want uh, more privacy, um, then you can maybe put a line in the, the chat box, I'm thinking, uh, with your email. And uh, my email is leonardgary at hotmail.com. And, and we can figure it out. Often things can be handled on email if it's something about being ill or whatever. So this is all new, obviously, um, and all this virtual stuff. Uh, so we'll, we're going to have to see how how that goes. Uh, you, you'll find it from time to time. I'll hold up images. Um, very simply, I'm trying to keep this low tech. I never use PowerPoint, so I'm not going to start now. But I do find that if I do something like this um, and hold it steady, you can you can see the image or, or an, an image like uh, like this one. Uh, let's see, yeah, where the, the mom is. Now, one problem is that the writing gets reversed. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what to do about it right now. But uh, this is a this is a cartoon of a mom feeding her cures, and the mom is saying, "See, this is to get outdoors," and and the child is saying, "Oh yeah, I saw this on one of the levels in my video." Uh, and that one of the themes of today's lecture, which is going to be between 60 and 90 minutes. I just don't totally know at this point how much I'll get in. And I'm basically going to try and get in most common on most of the main points of the lecture one that's that's posted. Uh, but, but the thematics of today's lecture is uh, what are the primary issues of the 20th and the 21st century? What, what sort of upheavals, social, cultural, psychological, economic, uh, physical, gender, constructions, um, concepts of desire, uh, uh, racial tension, all these sorts of things. How did they uh, present in the 20th and 21st century? And this will give us the context to understand literature. Um, obviously, the 20th and 21st century has other disciplines that have contributed. Uh, so the history of physics in the 20th and the 21st century, which would, uh, would obviously would feature someone like Einstein and um, in the theory of relativity, and that would be those those would be advances, if you will. This is about literature and film. So 
that's a diff it's a very different medium. Uh, art with a capital A and literature and film in particular, uh, as I mentioned in my half hour, my seven minute introduction, which is also posted on YouTube and I think uh, under announcements or something, um, is, is, you know, art registers what we might call the ineffable. It, it registers what would otherwise go unrecorded. Um, you know, things like the price of a house or or an event or the election of, of, a, of a president and so on. These things get recorded um, and they're called facts for want of a better word. Um, but art is trying to leave an impression of um, life, of the sort of fleeting life. Uh, what one of the writers we'll look at is James Joyce. And he, he described his ambition as to describe the curve of an emotion. Um, obviously that's not necessarily the intent of Einstein. Um, and, and that's the problem because an emotion isn't one thing. You can be angry, sad, anxious. You can be all of them at once. Uh, so a character in a novel like Mrs. Dalloway, another book that we're doing, uh, will register fleeting emotions too. Because it's not like you're sad all day long or you're angry all day long as a rule. You go back and forth. Um, and although we can plot our emotions and say, you know, I got sad when the letter didn't come. Uh, emotions aren't really mappable. Uh, you know, they're not thoroughly um, mappable. It's a little like the Heisenberg principle in physics, where you can you can either chart the velocity of something or its location, but you can't do both at once. Uh, and and emotions can can be like that. So, uh, when you're studying literature and film and poetry as part of the literature. You're going to be you're going to be trying to catch emotions in flight, uh, and you're going to try and get a better sense of yourself because of the way the author has, or the film director has presented. So there's often a shock of recognition in literature and film, but it's a complicated shock. It's not just like oh that happened to me Tuesday, um, although it might be that specific. But usually there's a there's a bit of a shock of like wow other people have felt this, other people have made this mistake. Uh, other people have denied something central to their life and until it until it impacted on on their ability to function. And, and so it's not just me. So a big part of literature is that we do feel less alone because we see that other people wrestle with problems that uh, we perhaps thought were just private mutations of, of, of our own psyche. Uh, so to go to the the text. So there's so many problems in the world. And the 20th century is a time where there was an increasing belief that there would be answers, that everything could could be answered. So one of one of the basic themes of this entire class will be note note this massive shift from religion as a dominant discourse, as a dominant way of understanding ourselves and our relationship to others and to the world. And that shift over to science. So that religion and the age of faith coming, you know, kind of coming up to the 19th century uh, is not not replaced by the age of science. So you might have to say it was eclipsed in, in the sense that religion didn't just disappear. And there are plenty of people who still have faith. But as the dominant discourse, as the thing we go to to explain reality, science is more dominant now than religion. It doesn't mean you can't explain the world with religion. It just means that it's not the thing that everyone is going to and and in, and certainly not even this. We're more aware of multiple faiths. There There isn't a, uh, a monolith of Christianity. And uh, that that too can confuse the issue. So the one of the poets we'll look at, Auden, described the 19th century as the age of anxiety. Uh, and that's partly what follows, because when you shift from an age of faith to an age of science, you, the individual moves into an age of anxiety. Somehow the space in between religion and science is anxious, because we're not certain that there's an all-knowing God who knows what's best for us and knows how everything's going to end. And we're not completely certain that science will be able to explain everything. 
So there's what I call, and this is a major theme in the class, a loss of transcendental certitude in the, going from the 19th to the 20th century. When you're in an age of faith, you can that there's a certainty that transcends everyday matters. Um, so you can make mistakes, everyone can make mistakes, but there's something omniscient, omnipotent, transcendent that keeps score. And traditionally within the religious paradigm, we've, we've understood that connection as the connection between an individual soul um, and an omnipotent God. So the, the more you sync with that omnipotent God, the more you feel at peace with your soul and the less you're in sync, it's kind of like divine Wi-Fi. Um, so if you sin, as we might call it, break the law, it's one thing, but sinning is, it could be the same action. But um, when we think of it as sinning, it's more like have offended the transcendent omnipotent, omnipotent power and not just the state or your neighbor or uh, whomever you've offended with robbery or, or whatever the, the, the uh, action might be. So uh, the soul, roughly speaking, as you move, you move from the age of faith to the age of faith, the individual finds themselves in an age of anxiety, looking for certitude because there was that loss of a, of a guaranteed transcendent certitude, which was replaced or appeared to be replaced by uh, scientific discourse, which in some ways obviously could learn much more about the world than the age of faith ever even bothered to because it was god's world not ours anyway it wasn't up to us to understand it um it was up to us to try and understand our relationship to god not to minerals and um, elements and so many of the things that we've made advances upon in in the age of science um so in line with that you have to imagine moving from an, an age where we tended to locate ourselves as having a soul in relation to an omniscient power. When you lose that, when you lose the connection of a sense of a, of a transcendent power, the soul isn't very useful all of a sudden because it's, its sole use was to, was to see how it was to try and keep you in sync with something above and beyond this world. And if there's nothing above and beyond this world, or at least nothing that people are acknowledging, um, the soul doesn't have a function. And what happens is it kind of translates into what we call the self. So the movement from soul to self, because the self is a, is a more practical, secular way of organizing your experience. Um, so we have issues of self-improvement and self-doubt. And it's a very hyphenated word um, because the self is a seeking construct. It doesn't, there's nothing except what you can make so there is no presumption of, of an omniscient has already worked out the pattern within which you find yourself uh if if you don't find a way to make it happen nothing is happening so there's this in some ways this, this both increases anxiety it's like it's all up to me whether it happens or not um and also can be exhilarating at times like hey it's all up to me so the cult of individualism tends to celebrate the, the positive side of the self, which is uh, self-determination, um, you know, that, that you can make the Olympics or um, get to law school. Or it, and, and it's not that these things are just flat out not true. It's just that there isn't that extra falling back of and, and well, in any way, there is something more important and larger than that um, and bigger than me. Uh, so the self, puts a lot of emphasis on the individual. So much so that it, it can obscure the, the degree to which we are interconnected, to relate it. Um, and we can start to either ignore or deny that what we do affects others. Um, and um, this will be at the heart of the first book we read, The Picture of Dorian Gray. It's not hard to recount the plot, so don't worry about this. This is definitely a spoiler, but it, it'll help you because the point of a lot of what we read in here won't be the plot. It, it, the plot will be a vehicle for exploring deeper issues. So in Dorian Gray, you just have, you have a young man one day painted, his portrait is being painted by a man named Basil, and this is being observed by another man named Lord Henry, who the whole time is 
telling Dorian Gray his theory of the modern age, which is that there is no transcendent anything. And the only point in living is to have as much pleasant sensation as possible. So he's kind of a hedonist and, and he defends this as, you know, we're born, we live, we die. Um, so as much pleasure as we can get. And it really doesn't matter about other people. Um, they're trying to do the same thing. So either you take pleasure or somebody will take pleasure from you. So this, this uh, devolves in, into what I would what I've called the vampiric relationship of self to other. The self can only enhance itself by depleting other selves. It's a zero sum game because there's no soul involved anymore. There's no, there's no sense that everybody has a soul that connects to God. There's a sense that everybody's trying to get what they can from everybody else. And that isn't even meant to sound cynical. It's just practical. Um, and so, Dorian Gray is a very young man. He's 18, I think, and very he's very handsome. Uh, and he's and people he's very well regarded because he's so handsome and sort of effortlessly charming. Other than that, he doesn't understand a whole lot about anything. So he's fascinated with Lord Henry's philosophy. And but then Lord Henry adds another layer to it and says, um, but, you know, when you get older, Dorian, you're not going to look this good. Uh, you're going to get old and, and people will drop you. People will dump you. People will care less about you. So do get what you can while you can. You're handsome. Uh, you're charming. You'll get away with a lot. You, you'll be a self that can take from others. And I think we can still recognize this. We are very much in a, in a youth culture. Um, there is there is anti wrinkle cream, whatever that is. Uh, it, it's so many ways to act like you don't have to get wrinkles. Um, there's a, there's anti-aging and not, I mean, there's, I'm not sure what that is either. We used to call it stay healthy. Um, the implication is you can either pause or even reverse aging, which does lead to the other primary source of anxiety in the 20th century, which is that we don't really have a way to deal with mortality. Uh, in an age of faith, Again, that presumption is that this is just one form. Uh, when we die, um, we go somewhere. Uh, I mean, again, in simple terms, it could be heaven or hell, or, or uh, but something spiritual, let's say. And that was a that was a way to or organize our relationship to mortality. Like, yes, you die, but that's not the end. But what if it is? And that that becomes the problem um, with faith: is that no matter how much I should say with science, no matter how much science can advance medical uh, aid, and it has incredibly, it, it, nobody's immortal. Science is, and science doesn't even claim really that that's going to happen outside of science fiction. So science can help you stay healthy, help you stay, quote unquote, young. It can extend your lifespan. It cannot eliminate mortality. So you're left with no real clear idea uh, of what it all means when, when you finally die. So Lord Henry is like, so what, well, what it all means is you have as much pleasure as you can and then you, then you get old, nobody cares, and then you die. Um, this terrifies Dorian to the point where he says, I wish that the painting would get old, the portrait of me in the painting. I wish that it would age and get old and get ugly and not me. And then he says, and this is a direct quote, for that, I would give my soul. So it's a kind of an old fashioned story in a way, like selling your soul to the devil. I mean, Lord Henry is rather devil like. He's a very modern Satan, so he's not, doesn't have horns, but he's a tempter. Uh, and, but he's also different than Satan, perhaps, in that he, I get the feeling that he kind of believes what he says. He's not just tricking Dorian Gray. And that he, as far as we can tell, he didn't make the portrait suddenly take on the properties of aging. That just somehow happened. So he's not that typical kind of Satan who makes you sign a contract and gives you some kind of treasure and then you realize you've been tricked and then he owns your soul. Um, Dorian Gray's panic, his anxiety about I won't always be young, causes him to make a deal with, if not the devil, uh, just basically give up on viewing life as uh, something that where you could try and figure out what your relationship is to others and what your relationship is to your own mortality, how 
the fact that you will die affects the way you choose to live. He just bails on all of that. And the result is that the painting begins to get ugly as Dorian Gray pursues pleasure at all costs. Usually, well, almost in every case at the expense of, of people he uses. And he starts using people all the time. And you begin to realize that the painting also seems to be Dor Oscar Wilde's um, modern poor sense of well, what do we do without a soul? Like the soul used to register bad things we did. And then we felt bad about them. This is the theory, at least. And then we asked for forgiveness, maybe from God, certainly. And often we'd then be counseled to ask forgiveness for, from others. So confession and forgiveness make sense in an age of faith, because you, again, believe in an omnipotent being that can actually remove your sins. Um, and then you can promise not to do it again. And Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but if you do, you'll feel bad again, and you'll say again, you won't do it, and, and you'll struggle with it. But that, that, that's all gone when there's no sense of a, of a higher power that can absolve you of your sins. So one of the things that, that Dorian Gray has no access to in, until, the, in, until the very end, and then he can't even bring himself to, to do it, is confession forgiveness. He never confesses, really. He doesn't ask for forgiveness because he doesn't feel um, the effects of uh, of how his treatment has uh, has affected others. The painting just gets ugly. Dorian Gray can't feel. Uh, so when he treats people badly just for some pleasure, as he will with Sybil Vane, the first young woman that he falls in love with, he uses her and discards her and uh, in such a brutal way that she takes her own life. Okay, it's a spoiler, but it's talking about the dynamics here. Um, but he won't, at first it bothers him, um, before he knows that she's taken her own life. He goes back home and says, what the hell did I just do? I, that, that was terrible. I'm going to go back tomorrow. I'm going to apologize. Uh, I'm going to ask her to marry me. Um, and then Lord Henry shows up to say, oh, by the way, she's dead. She's dead. And then Dorian Gray's in a terrible spot because now he can't easily undo what his, what he did has effects that he can't undo. He can't bring her back to life. So he allows Lord Henry to persuade him that it doesn't matter. Sybil Bain's dead. People die. Um, he didn't kill her. Uh, yeah, he just dumped her when it suited him, but um, he didn't murder her, and therefore it doesn't matter. It's nothing to, to think about or worry about or uh, just move on. Uh, it happens. It can happen to a woman every week. It does. It just breaks. So Again, it's, I, I, I caution you that it's not necessarily cynical. It's, it's almost hopeless and directionless. The, the, the harm that Dorian Gray perpetuates, he's, he's not exactly evil in the, in the sense that we normally think of it. He's certainly not a Darth Vader who's aware uh, of the destruction that he's unleashing. Um, uh, his point is to get as much pleasure as possible. I don't see Darth Vader in, enjoying himself much in, in the Star Wars series. Um, other than, you know, marching down the hallway to his own theme song. Bum, 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 bum. It's like, this is all life. But, um, so the, uh, the other issue that comes up is how do, you, how do you know anybody else? Like the only way to possibly get a better sense of yourself is to understand yourself through someone else. But the portrait, once he locks it in the attic and won't let anybody see it, it cuts him off from any capacity to build either compassion, empathy, or sympathy. Because all three of those emotions, we'll call them, can only get generated by seeing that you've hurt someone and by being hurt, and in both cases, reflecting on it somehow. So. If you push a kid down in the schoolyard and they cry, you might get it like, oh, that wasn't very nice of me. But you're going to get it a lot more when someone does it to you and everybody laughs at you and you're crying and you're like, oh, my God, that's is that what I did to that kid? Because now you don't have to wonder what it's like, you know. And granted, you can layer up and say, well, I don't care. I'm just going to figure out a way to never get pushed down and I'm going to be the one who pushes. Plenty of people do that. Some of them get elected to high office. But um, that, that's, a, that's a kind of Dorian Gray um, layering where you just decide that 
you're not going to empathize. Uh, people are going to be losers or suckers. Um, you're, and you're not going to be one of them. Um, and you're never going to admit a mistake. And you're never going to ask for forgiveness because you never do anything wrong. Uh, and no one, you don't have to be compassionate with anybody um, because you're going to put yourself in a position where you don't, at least you feel, you'll never need the sympathy of others. You, you prefer strength, control, domination to relationship, uh, understanding, uh, comforting. Um, so that is what you're going to be reading about. And as you, uh, and I will talk some more about Dorian Gray on, in lecture two, but because you obviously have, probably haven't come into this class, uh, having read the novel, it doesn't much matter the order of things. If you haven't finished the novel, and I'm talking about just finish it. If you have finished it, great. That it is no specific ratio of, uh, uh, of that. And most students say if they read the work first, it's fine, but they don't really get it. Then the lectures make them more interested and they go back and look at it again. So do it any way that, uh, that works for you. This is kind of a do it yourself class and even more now that I'm a virtual avatar uh, that shows up on your screen. I'm probably competing with YouTube cat videos right now and losing, but what am I going to do? Uh, and then every now and then you'll, even if you're doing that, the damn cat will finally fall off the table and then you'll pay attention to me for a few minutes. Uh, so I don't, I don't have any grandiose ideas of how riveted um, you will be to this, to this image. Um, so in a moment of panic, Dorian Gray sells his soul in return for eternal youth. Uh, and you know, it's funny how the portrait in the attic can correspond a bit with something like Facebook, if we try and bring us into the present. Because 1893, that's when the novel's written, it's incredibly prescient. It was considered a little bit light at the time, because it wasn't like Shakespearean tragedy. But it's aged really well, because Wilde's genius really got to pop culture and into how appearances would become much more important than substance. Uh, nowadays, we don't seem to know what a fact is. You can watch Fox, you can watch CNN, everything's fake news. What does that even mean? Um, all news is fake in the sense that it's not literally the thing that happened while it's happening. So then some news is more fake than others, but what does that mean? How do you, how do you, uh, there's a real crisis starting in the 20th century in, in determining the relative value, like, not, nothing's 100% truth. There are degrees of, of, of value to, to what we call truth value. But it's very hard to figure that out now. Um, things are so polarized, so partisan. People already feel like they know their team and everybody else is wrong. And part of that is not the, so much the people. It's We've had this dominant discourse for a long time that is pretty relativistic. It doesn't have a transcendent source to which all of us exist agree uh, is the arbiter of truth. It's not a, it's not God. I mean, even things like the Supreme Court or the, 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 these get questioned immediately. Um, so we don't have that high. It, it seems increasingly to uh, to require that, um, uh, that that the powerful will win, not not the ones who are more or less Right. We don't have those King Solomon moments where somebody wise is able to find out the truth of, uh, of a situation. Um, so there's so in, and in Facebook, let's face it, we, we do edit our we don't put every picture of us on Facebook. We tend to put well, we put the ones we like at, the, at a minimum. And sometimes we we might just um, engineer them even more than that. So Facebook is kind of a modern portrait in the attic. In, in a, funny way. And, and even this, I've, I'm, I've never done Tinder, so I don't know about this sweep left, sweep right, swipe, sweep, um, swipe or no swiping, if you, if you remember Dora. Um, but uh, it's very Dorian Grayish, where you, you, have an, you have a picture of somebody on Tinder, which may or may not be that person. And it may or may not be, let's say it is the person, it's going to be them at their best. And uh, who knows what their mood is like, or who knows how they treat people. But anyway, you swipe left or right based on that. Um, who knows who you're swiping away? Who knows who you're swiping in? And then maybe you meet them, but you're gonna have to find out. That's just a, the, the person behind the Tinder 
portrait is the actual person. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and, you know, we have to figure that out. Not that people are easy to figure out. Uh, T.S. Eliot, who's uh, another poet we'll be reading in, in a poem called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, has a great line where he says, we prepare a face to meet the faces that we meet. So if you prepare your face to meet a face that that person has already prepared, uh, who are you, who are you meeting? I mean, they're meeting a, a mask, you're meeting a mask. Um, I'm looking for uh, an image here. Of, and I, some of these are on the, the printed um, text. Um, I guess this one will have to do is, uh, if, if you look closely, um, it's just, it's a, a girl who has a, her face is on a mirror that she's holding to the left of, uh, of herself while she is depressed, if you will, or so she, the face is smiling, but, um, but she herself is upset and sad. And that's such a common problem in, in modern life. The, the whole concept of depression, really, is, is how you feel behind the facade of how you try to be. It gets so attenuated, so disconnected, um, that people can't reach in to help you and you can't reach out to ask for help. Uh, in A11, we'll read a, a novel called The Bell Jar that's, that has this image of being behind glass. It looks like you're there, but you're not reaching out and nobody's reaching in. That's a very modern concept of depression and, and Dorian Gray kind of the individual kind of arrives at that where since all he's ever sought is sensation and he has no idea of who he is beyond that and he has no idea of who anyone else is other than as a potential source uh, uh, for sensation. Um, so there's uh, th there are endless ways to distract and, and to seek sensation. But virtual popularity, YouTube stars, celebrities, I mean, if we judge from the high percentage of celebrities in drug rehab, that kind of popularity for your mask deepens loneliness and rather than alleviates it. So you actually have that paradox of being, say, famous or getting 5,000 likes, but it doesn't go through to, and connect anything of, of real significance. So in a world where sensation, we're in a world where sensation is substituted for significance. There's another sort of post-it note you can put about this class. And innumerable forms of addiction replace the stability once sought for in rituals and traditions. Another huge theme in this class, what is the difference between an addiction and a ritual? Because the other consequence of moving from age of faith age of science, from the soul as that which constructs experience to the self is substitutability. We're endlessly trying to find that other thing that will make the self feel complete. But the self is like a bucket with a hole in it. It just takes it in and the new thing from the mall, uh, the new lover, the new whatever it is, it goes right in and it feels good while, it's, while you're attaining it. And then yourself is still hungry. That's the vampiric. Like you have to keep looking for fresh blood, even at the Scarborough Town Center. Um, like the bus sticker I saw that said center yourself at the Scarborough Town Center, making it sound like uh, a cathedral. Uh, and that makes sense in a way because we're constantly searching in the secular for the equivalent of a lost sacred. So the mall, and I don't know, lately with COVID and since March, uh, this is changing the brick and mortar, but the mall was cathedral-like is the Eden Center. It's built very high. It's everything is, is there's a lot of glass uh, at the, in the ceiling levels. Um, and, uh, and instead of little altars, we have little shops. And, and it's a place where you can go just for what's sometimes called retail therapy. It just doesn't, because it, the difference between addiction and ritual, many, this is a long discussion, but just briefly, is that uh, ritual is, is doing something over and over again in an attempt to get a better understanding of yourself. Addiction is doing something over and over again to avoid understanding yourself. 
So what Dorian Gray does with people is addictive. He uses them up so he doesn't have to know who he is. Whereas a ritual, obviously going to, to mass or mosque uh, or temple or, and so on, the point, you do it over and over again. That's the, in that sense, addiction and ritual um, are impossible to tell apart. The difference is in, in repetition because they both require it. The difference is in the result of the repetition. In addiction, it's, it just stays at zero. And when you have to do more and more of an actual drug or whatever it might be to get the same effect of not knowing yourself, this Dorian Gray gets addicted to using people, but it doesn't help him. And he uses them more and more. And he starts using them, you know, as if they were Oxycontin or something or, or heroin. Uh, and uh, he needs more and more and, and, feel, and feels less and less. So, so it did, that's where we talk about that spiraling down in addiction. Um, whereas a, a ritual is more of a circle of life, if I can, you know, um, paraphrase Elton John <laughs> and the Lion King, but there's a, some sense that, that, you know, things die and get reborn or something. So some idea of yourself you had gets damaged, but out of that damage and through with the help of the ritual, um, Phoenix-like, you can rise out of the ashes a little bit. So when inevitable crises occur in your life and you're, and you're hurt in any number of ways, if your rituals are intact, you, you have a pretty good chance of, um, of coming out of that actually stronger than before it happened. I mean, even something like a funeral, the funeral is not for the person who has died, it's for the people that the dead person has left behind. And depending on the degree of closeness to the deceased, you are supported by others who go to the funeral. So sometimes you're at a funeral because someone very close to you has died and you're just de devastated and upset. Other times you go to a funeral because you, you do know the person who died, but they weren't super close to you. And you're, you're, you become aware that one of your points in going to the funeral is not all about you. It's that you're in a position to help somebody because this was their father, let's say, and it, and it was it was your uncle or, or it was a teacher that you liked or something where you can comfort them because, frankly, they're more devastated than you are. And which is not to say you didn't care. You wouldn't be there. So if you if you see what I'm going, this is interrelationship. This is where it, the cult of individualism can be very alienating. Because if we're all out, it's like I, you say, oh, well, this dead guy, I mean, I knew him, but um, I don't have to go to the funeral. Um, and it won't even occur to you that, no, you don't. But maybe there's people there that you know that you could help. And increasingly that's seen as a kind of, um, why, like, why would I do that? Like, what's in it for me is something that comes up a lot. And that's a really good question, because if you go to a funeral where you didn't know someone very well and you comfort somebody who was close to them, what was in it for you? Well, in terms of the way we construct value these days, virtually nothing. Like you didn't get paid, you, you didn't work an extra billable hour. Um, so there was nothing in it for you. It's that nothing though, that becomes important. A lot of things happen in that, in that nothing space. Can't be monetized, can't be qualified, can't be quantified, uh, can't be profited from in the ways when we're, we're used to. One of the problems in, in this is in the age of science is very akin to the age of economics. And uh, the one, it's not so much that money is a bad value system. What's causing a lot of problems is these days it seems to be the only value system. Like everything is worth what, it, what it, kind of profit it would or would not generate in the marketplace. Um, and so you could write a fantastic novel, but if nobody really got it, you didn't make any money. So, and you said to somebody, oh yeah, I hope it's a novel. They do, how, many, how many copies did it sell? How many millions of dollars did you get? Were there movie rights? And if you say no, 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 you know, at a certain point, they're gonna be like, wow, that must've been a terrible novel. Um, but Vincent van Gogh didn't sell any of his paintings. Uh, he sold one um, while he was alive and it was, and the person he sold it to used it to patch up a hole in her chicken coop. They recovered the painting and they kind of restored it and sold it later for $23 million. The woman bought it for about $10 and then, then used it to patch up a hole in the roof of a chicken coop. And now it's in the Museum of Modern Art having been bought for $23 million and donated. So, you know, what 
in that sense, money is not a very is not a good value indicator because it doesn't correspond to the essence of anything. What something is worth in terms of money is what you can get for it, not necessarily what it what it's worth in terms of its intrinsic integral constitutive structure, which is why cliches like you can't buy love make a lot of sense. Um, and, and the inverse of that, that, you know, love won't pay the rent. Also true, but there's more than paying the rent. Um, uh, but sometimes the sole value system, and because it, it, partly because money is close to what we used to call grace. It, it operates like when you look, when you think about the the, uh, the stock market, and right now the stock market doesn't make any sense. It keeps going up and up, and like nobody has a job, nobody's shopping. No, why? What is this? It, it seems more obvious than ever that the stock market is about something else. It's about money making money. It's not really about how you or I are doing in terms of our salary or what we buy. Uh, and that makes it weirdly like um, like a religious. Uh, it's almost like the stock market is a weird religion. It goes up and down. Nobody knows why. Uh, it, it's because it crashes every now and then and nobody predicts it. Uh, you can either be favored by it and, be, and your two billion becomes four billion, becomes eight billion, whatever. So it, it acts like grace. It, act, it acts like a divine source of value. And in monetary terms, it can be. I mean, if you bought Apple stock, you know, when, when the first Apple computer showed up, that, that stock you bought would be worth much, much more than whatever you paid for. You buy Apple stock now, it's like, who knows, you might even lose money because the stock has been adjusted um, for, for its value. So money acts like it is the equivalent of the actual value um, of, of whatever it's attached to, but it's got no connection actually, no relationship. Uh, an example that you'll know very well is the grade you get in the class is not who you are. Like you're not a C plus. You can get a C plus, you can get an F. You're not an F either. You can get an A plus, you're not an A plus. You're, you're none of those things. And you're all of those things. But th that's just a grading that, that gets put on you and you're all powerful grade point average, which is presented as, some kind of Wizard of Oz. Uh, if you're 3.8, that's better than 3.7. Yeah, but well, only within certain narrow, very narrow um, understandings, because that number combines every class you've ever had, every it, it, that you've done, and doesn't, and it reflects zero of what you know or feel or can express. Uh, it means you perform well in any number of classes, but there's nothing in that number that says anything. About who you are and how your experiences were affected um, uh, by that. Um, so, to uh, I'm, I'm scrolling quickly through my text here, which you can read later. And obviously, I've been extemporizing. Um, but um, here's a, here's another. What is it we want to say about the 20th century? A preliminary approach might be. Uh, answers have less and less credibility in a more and more subjective world. So art in the 20th century develops a more and more sophisticated way to, not to give answers, but to ask more subtle and more challenging questions. And, and in, in questions that don't have answers, leaves them hanging, which is one reason literature can be frustrating, especially in, in, in our modern scientific time. Like, what's this person trying to say? Why don't they just say it? Well, if you can just say it, it's not that worth it's really not worth trying to write a play about it. Uh, because what the, what great literature is trying to do is say that that are, can't be said. So, or, or or picture things that can't be pictured. I mean, they'll have to picture something, but they're, they're, they're trying to be evocative and provocative and uh, as opposed to answering something. Uh, great art is not Google. Um, Google's kind of remarkable in its way, but it's, it's also very, tinny it's very one note you ask you ask this question you get this answer that's it uh it's just information um it's not wisdom i mean you might use the information to become wise but it's in itself is is statistics and information and data data is very valuable these days but only in the marketplace amazon and alexa and all those people well, she's not a person but they collect data so they can market more effectively 
Uh, so data can generate a lot of money, but data is also lifeless. It doesn't actually mean anything. It's it's the, the treatise of living. It's it's not it's not itself either alive um, or life for that matter. Um, another way to think about the 20th century is to talk about what I call the architects of the 20th century. Some of them, and I and there's four that I there's many more than that, but these four are very highly representative. So. You'll find me talking about uh, Darwin, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, and, and they each introduced in different ways theories about how the unknown influences the known. Uh, so this is another major theme of the whole class is this discovery that what you know, what you see is, a, is actually the facade of something else behind it, which doesn't mean it's fake or a lie. It just means there's more to it than meets the eye. Um, and so for Darwin, the, the shock was that, you know, the, 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 basically the story of Adam and Eve got challenged. There was a sense of mankind being a separate species that God created and then gave dominion of the earth and everything on it to Adam and Eve. Uh, evolution wreaks havoc with that, to say the least, if you're, if we're, if we're evolved from, uh, then suddenly it's, it pushes us back into interrelationship, like we're a species too. I mean, obviously we, we, we are the most highly evolved by most standards, um, but we're still, we're still an animal species and we still require this earth to survive, just like everything on it. Something you would, would kind of, and we forget that. We use nature as a resource, not as, a, not as our, the source of us. So we get into issues of pollution and whether you think global warming is real or not, there's clearly, um, we had an effect on this planet because we are so good at converting its source into resource. But a lot of that resource, whether it's oil or plastic, um, it, it, it briefly diverts the self in any number of ways. And, but then it goes into landfill, um, or gets burned or becomes a, a massive, a plastic island in the ocean somewhere. So we we keep churning through this stuff, which like Dorian Gray gives us sensation, commodities and, and all the rest, but it doesn't have any intrinsic value and it just becomes waste. Um, so the self is very wasteful in that sense. It consumes at a ferocious rate, uh, not because it needs all this stuff, but because consuming it makes the self feel more complete, even though it's fundamentally incomplete, that's its central constitutional features that self needs something that it hasn't found yet. And nothing it finds will ever be that thing it seeks, because it can't even name what it is it wants. It just wants. The object of your desire really isn't what you want, it's what makes you want. And it makes you want until you get it. And then you don't want it anymore because you have it. And then you want something else. Uh, so that's the addiction model. I mean, even though the modern economy is based much more on, on an addictive um, structure. Uh, it, modern consumption requires in a way that nothing you buy satisfies you for long. Um, because there's so much to consume, so much more than you literally need. That there has to be a sort of psychological addictive sense that you have to keep consuming to be um or as one artist says i shop therefore i am as opposed to you know i think therefore i am descartes famous cogito marx uh, karl marx also found something behind the, the facade he, he said more or less that economics is class warfare it's not it's not simply a meritocracy that you get because you were hard and you deserve it. There's ownership, there's unionizing, there's exploiting people, there's slavery. Um, and the people who make the rules, the ruling class, make the rules in such a way that their access to wealth is, is more open than it is to those who don't make the rules. But the people who don't make the rules get tired sometimes. And they might go so far as to have a revolution, the Russian revolution, the American revolution. The French Revolution, three of the most obvious, all occur when a class that feels like they're hopelessly disenfranchised, that the laws are so set against their ever advancing that they more or less storm the castle or they march on Washington 
say, in the days of Martin Luther King, or they take to the street in, in the current Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there is a degree to which they finally say, okay, I don't seem to be able to get this done through the laws that have been written the way they, they've been written. And even though I'm told that's the way I should do it, uh, it's, it, the laws are designed in such a way that I'm never going to get through, so I have to challenge the law. This Famously, this was referred to as civil disobedience, uh, or um, what was the John Lewis said recently, make, make good trouble, I think, which is a similar idea, that there are, potentially there are times when the, the proper thing to do is refuse the law, and slavery is often brought up as an obvious case in point, that it is immoral to support slavery, whether it's legal or not, making it legal doesn't make it moral. And, and that is the other value crisis in the 20th century is it, there was an assumption with the Ten Commandments and other things that, um, that the legal and the moral were sort of the same, but it's not true at all. You can use the law to do really immoral things and do them legally. So you don't go to jail, you don't get charged, other people get hurt, other people may even go to jail. Uh, so you can use the law um, to do it. In a way, Dorian Gray is, is a little like that too. He uses the laws of attraction uh, to diminish and destroy uh, others in a way that never seems to, to touch him. Uh, so Freud, he found something behind the conscious mind. He called it the unconscious. Um, and he suggested that the unconscious was, in, in a strange way, because it was so unacknowledged, was more powerful than the conscious. It's the image of, of the conscious mind was almost like somebody clinging to a galloping horse, trying not to be thrown off. So your so-called id, or, or your the urges that are sort of pre-social, uh, have to be kept in check by your ego, by uh, by any number of things. And this was fascinating. Um, Dorian Gray was written about only about seven years before the Psychopathology of Everyday Life, which was Freud's first big uh, book. So, so Wilde wouldn't have known Freud particularly, but he's pretty much predicting Freud because the, the portrait in the attic is also the unconscious. Um, it's the thing that is, is actually controlling Dorian Gray, even though he thinks he's in control because he's locked it up. Well, Freud will call that repression. And this, in the short term, repressing things and denying things is effective. It allows you to go, keep going. But if you do it too much and too often and everywhere, you start to get dragged down by the number of things you're stuffing in your attic. Um, and then you become symptomatic. You become depressed. You become anxious. You seek help. And, and psychoanalysis, so-called, or psychotherapy or count, even counseling is partly, is mostly predicated on trying to help you unpack your attic. Can you go back to the attic and find some of those things? that you stuffed in there because you didn't have time to deal with it. But now you're, it's, it's burdening you because you, you don't understand your own behavior. You don't understand why you broke up with somebody or even why you, or why you got attracted to someone in the first place or why you keep getting attracted to the same kind of person even though they all ends the same way that you don't like. Well, why? You know, what are these patterns in your conscious life? Why, why are they so repetitive when you swear, you're, okay, I'm not going to do that again, and then you do it again? Okay, I'm not, and then you do, and and um, uh, that's that's where Freud came in and said that you've gotten hurt in the past, you've gotten trained, you, you are, you're you're averse to some things, you're possibly phobic about some things, and that will determine that will have a huge effect on what you might think of as free choice. It's a choice, but not entirely free. Uh, Nietzsche. The, the German philosopher is most famous for his comment, God is dead, um, which, but that's not really, was not really the point. What he, what he says in the entire passage is, God is dead, we have killed him, what fools we are, because what are we going to do to replace him? I mean, it's, it's all very well to kill a God, kill your God, kill God. Um, and what are you going to do in a godless world? So Nietzsche's really trying to chastise humanity for its incredible arrogance in moving over from the age of faith to the age of science as if that were a pure triumph over like superstition like religion suddenly was superstition but it wasn't there, there, there was a way in which religion helped us be moral science tends to be better at helping us 
be legal. Um, so those are what I call the four architects of modernity. Um, and there are any, they're all subcategories, uh, but they, 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 they are sort of basic pillars where I can make the point. Um, so yeah, so before I introduce, this is all in your text, uh, the notion of an unconscious where difficult feelings have been repressed, but still exert an invisible pull. Um, the steam engine, interestingly enough, was coming into vogue when Freud was writing, and he actually uses that metaphor of hydraulics to suggest that the mind is a closed system. So you can build up steam in a certain part of your mind. So you, you can exceed, uh, you can succeed, you can accomplish things powered by your repressions. Like, like you have to be, you have to get an A plus. Uh, because if you don't, any insecurities you have or, or any concerns about it, how others will view you, will, will you imagine them as intolerable. So that's actually a force. It's not always bad. There's nothing wrong getting an A. The problem is having a nervous breakdown trying to get an A. Because the very phrase nervous breakdown, which, which sounds mechanical, a breakdown. Your car breaks down. Your computer breaks down. So to say people break down is to really view people like machines. And, and that is certainly a big part, um, even of Freud's systems, where he basically felt like he was a mechanic almost, trying to alter the way that steam pressure or repression is, is being used to, uh, to exert enormous force, some of it good, some of it bad. So, so a lot of it's going to, what's the ratio of, of good to bad? You could be the CEO of a large company and be suicidally depressed or not. You might also be happy. It's going to depend on how you've organized the, the steam pipes in, in your psyche. Um, and so the song that I, uh, did, that I put uh, in your text was a song. You, I mean, I don't know these songs get older and older since I keep teaching forever. Uh, this is by a group called REM, maybe you've heard of them, and the song is uh, Losing My Religion, so obviously appropriate. What's, what's interesting about the song, makes it seem to echo Dorian Gray, is that the singer will talk about that's me in the corner, that's me in the spotlight, losing my religion. Again, that's the theme of this class. You're either in the spotlight performing with a mask, or you're in the corner depressed disabled, frightened. And this doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground. Um, so we flick, we flicker back and forth. We're either performing and we're on, um, or we're kind of by ourselves wondering what it's all about. And how do we balance those two? Again, we don't have a transcendent soul or a ritual. So it's, it can be a real challenge um, to how to meet the faces that you meet when you've prepared your face and they've prepared their face. So intimacy is, is much sought after in our time, but it's also much feared. Um, and most of the time, I don't think we realize how much we fear this, this intimacy that we feel we want, because it's much easier to want intimacy than experience it, because it's, intimacy is indistinguishable from vulnerability. So even when I watch The Bachelor, and yes, I have watched The Bachelor once, but twice, I don't know, maybe seen, you know, when, I mean, it's not hard to like somebody when you're in a hot tub and then you go to Paris for, you know, for a wine tasting, um, was certain to not like. So <laughs> these couples get formed, um, these sort of Ken and Barbie doll, uh, types get together, but it doesn't last uh, most of the time. It doesn't, doesn't go beyond a week yet, uh, after the show. Um, because if you're using the other person to further uh, elevate your prepared face, and then they're doing the same, you're not meeting at all. So in real intimacy is going to be letting someone behind the mask and, and having them do the same. And it has to be reciprocal, because if you take them behind your mask and they don't, um, there's going to be a problem. Uh, uh, you're going to feel you're going to be in love with their mask and they're going to be indifferent to you. That's, that's a real, that can be a real problem as that 
self-help book says, you know, he's just not that into you or she's just not that into us. The whole book, you just have to read the title. Um, but we can fool ourselves. We can make it seem like someone's more into us than they actually are. But the real test is, uh, are they asking us to help them keep them, keep preserve their mask? In other words, flatter them all the time, let's say. And like, you're, you're so handsome, you're so great. Is that all they want from us? That's all Dorian Gray wants from me. Um, or, or, or do we feel like we're in a, a relationship with the other person likes to have us around when we praise them and, and seems to sort of drift off into indifference when we're trying to talk about our own accomplishments or fears. So if you're not interested in the insecurities of someone else, you're not really interested in that person at all. Um, intimacy is, a, is sharing vulnerability. But it's not it's because the, we have this vampiric relationship of self to other. It's very hard to be vulnerable. Who wants to bear their neck to a vampire, to a predator? And, and it's not always easy uh, to tell. Um, so sometimes we just keep ourselves uh, locked up. Uh, so that's where the song of the song of the lecture uh, comes from. Um, and You'll see this chart when you look at the text, but the cycle of addiction um, begins with emotional pain, which then gets translated into a craving for relief. And then whatever that preoccupation that seems to offer relief is, we get more preoccupied with it. It could be a substance like OxyContin, or it could be a behavior like retail therapy. And so we do that compulsively uh, in a, in, in a kind of in an effort to relieve the original emotional pain that it really has no way to relieve the pain because it's a distraction from it. Nonetheless, a distraction is, it becomes a numbness and gives a, it's a short-term pain relief. Um, but because we're not really dealing with our emotional pain or its actual sores, that there tend to be negative consequences and from addictive behavior. Uh, which brings on pain, except now it brings on pain when we're at a point of lower self-esteem because we're kind of either ashamed or embarrassed that uh, whatever our compulsive behaviors have been. And that so that more pain, lower self-esteem, opens the door to depression, guilt, shame. And now we're back at the original emotional pain plus more. So that short-term relief is an illusion. Um, and when it fades, um, the, we, we have the emotional pain squared in a sense, which can drive us to, for to the craving for relief is doubled. And that's the downward spiral. Whereas ritual also, you, you would move toward a ritual from a place of emotional pain. You would move toward it craving relief, but the ritual would support you while you tried to understand the source behind the emotional pain. So a ritual that's effective is not a ritual that distracts you. It's a, it's actually a ritual that gives you enough support so you can feel the pain and work through it rather than run away from it. Uh, and, and that will certainly be a primary theme of, of Dorian Gray. Uh, I'm coming up to about an hour in this lecture, so I, I'm, I don't even know how this translates in, in terms of an hour in a classroom versus an hour from Zoom, Zoom, I know you can pause me, I won't be offended, uh, and go get a Mars bar or something, so it might be all right, but I don't, definitely don't wanna go about beyond a, uh, an hour and a half here. So, and I do have, the next lecture will still be on Dorian Gray and, and the 20th and 21st century. So what I'm gonna do to sort of um, be, try and bring some of these disparate elements um, to rest for now, is look at a, a, a poem written in 1863, so 30, about 30 years before Dorian Gray, by a man named Matthew Arnold, a British poet. And you may have heard of it, you might have even looked at it in high school. It's, it's called Dover Beach. Uh, and the setting is Dover Beach. Dover Beach, you know, if you're on the British, if you're in England, Dover Beach looks across a, a gulf of water to France. Um, so it's a, it's been contested over the years by England and France, but in terms of this is where literature becomes different from journalism or something else. It, the poem's called Dover Beach, but it's not going to be a Wikipedia entry on on 
Dover Beach. It will be about the place, but it's going to be more about a way that the poet felt when he was there, which means that almost everything about Dover Beach will be both what it is, Dover Beach, and either metaphor or allegory or illusion. In this case, the sense of the gap between where he's standing and then all this water and then the, and then land is becomes a sort of the most primitive metaphor of the poem. He feels alienated. He feels like he's like there's a gulf, a gap between him and what he needs or or what he wants. He's lonely. Now he seems to be in a ho some kind of hotel um, with with a, a woman uh, that he'll refer to later in the poem. So he could be a wife, could be a lover. Um, but he turns to her more in desperation um, than in companionship, as his own loneliness, his anxiety, even possibly his depression mounts in him. He finally turns to her uh, with this plea where he actually says, ah, love, let us be true to one another. For, and then be, I'm paraphrasing, nothing out there is real. Nothing anywhere is real. We're, we live, we're born, we die, um, nothing certain. We don't know anything. So let's make sure that we love each other. But of course, that's easier said than done. No wonder we put so much pressure on relationships, um, more than they can bear usually with the other person, as our popular songs insist. You're my whole heart. You're everything about me. Take my heart. Give me your heart. Why did you drop my heart? Um, you know, stop tearing my heart apart. Um, give it back. You can't have it anymore. <laughs> it's like two dogs with a chewy. Um, because we put everything on, okay, because if you love me above and beyond everything, I'm all right. If you don't, then I'm lost. And that really freezes a relationship in a, in a different kind of way where you, you're no longer exploring and learning about yourself or the other person. You're just dependent on, uh, on a regard that you ask them to maintain toward you that is uh, uh, like a photograph. It's not, it's not a very day-to-day -day living uh, relationship. Anyway, Dover Beach begins, curiously enough, the sea of faith, age of faith, so the sea was once too at the full round earth shore. So Arnold makes the metaphor fairly explicit here. It's like the, the, in this, I'm looking down at this beach, the ocean is uh, all the way around the beach, um, fully in, in, in encompassing the beach. Uh, that faith used to be like that. It used to encompass a person's life was once to at the full. So when you're reading poetry, you're really looking for word choice and, you, and you're, you're looking for words like but, once, however. Those tend to be important because that's the moment where the poem is sort of rounding on itself and, and saying, yeah, I know that's, okay, here's a beautiful ocean. We're all in a sea of faith. Great, let's all go home. Um, it's not gonna be like that. It's like, wait, this, this ocean's beautiful. Um, but my sense of being in a sea of faith is fractured, fragmented. So, uh, but comes the line, now I only hear the melancholy long withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. So the now is, is also a telling because what he's saying is, I used to think I was in an age of faith. I don't anymore. And it's like the wave, and you've all seen this at the beach, when a wave pulls out, it seems to drag everything down the beach a little ways, pebbles and hermit crabs and whatnot, and, and briefly leaves the beach just strewn with debris. Um, you know, it could be shells and rocks, or it could be plastic bottles. And then the next wave comes in and, and then draws out again. But what Arnold is using that metaphor to say is the age of faith is like a retreating wave that's not coming back. So if you could even imagine, and this doesn't seem plausible, an ocean where the waves are just, just receding and leaving behind naked, what he calls the naked shingles, which is the shore. Um, so he envisions this, this loss of faith, which I've been calling the loss of transcendental certitude because that gets us a little more into the emotional um, consequence of, of the age of faith withdrawing like a roaring wave leaves us uh, alone and uncertain. Um, and uh, he goes on in the, in the course of the poem, as I suggested, I love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us 
like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really, again that but, neither joy nor love. There's nothing out there that's intrinsically joyful or loving, nor light, nor certitude. Do you think I make this stuff up? But it's right there in the poem, 1863. Nothing out there is certain, nor peace, nor help for pain. And that takes us back to the addiction ritual uh, oscillation. And we are here as one is on a darkling plain or above a, a plot of some land at night, uh, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight. So now he's saying it's like life is like a two army, two hostile armies charging toward each other in pitch black. And so both hostile armies are blowing horns and shouting, but nobody can, nobody knows what to do because they can't even see. And he describes this as a place where ignorant armies clash by night. Uh, so you just charge right into your enemy and they charge right into you, but nobody knows what they're doing and the alarms don't make any sense and they don't help you organize your fighting strategy and you could just as well slash the head off your, your companion uh, as, as, a, as a hostile uh, enemy. Um, so I think I'm, there's a lot more in the, in the text, uh, but I think I'm going to bring this first tape to lecture to a close or around this. Um, when you do read the text though, I put it in the discussion section on purpose because it, that was the way to make it easy for you to ask any questions that you want. This coming Wednesday, and I'll put this in the announcements, uh, so that'll be the, the ninth, today being Monday. Um, I'm going to open the class at, uh, at 11 a.m. Wednesday for an hour anyway. I don't have a, it's not a lecture, it's just me opening the class. You can come in to the class and your names will show up on the side, which also doesn't necessarily matter. You can raise your hand and your little virtual hand will go up. Uh, and I'll ask you to do that. Um, and then I'll just try and get to people. Um, if there's absolutely nobody here, uh, I, I won't despair. I'll have my own work to do. <laughs> um, I'm not going to turn into Matthew Arnold, but um, start talking about the age of faith and ignorant armies. So it's not a pressure. It's not meant to be a pressure, but you can also ask the questions on the discussion board. I'll answer, I'll answer what I can there. Other other classmates might have something, if you want to share something, that's also okay. Like that thing you said about addiction reminds me of something that's could be a movie. I mentioned R.E.M., uh, Losing My Religion. Uh, that's songs from the 90s, which kind of dates me a little. But, um, you know, there's a little, there are still good songs now. Uh, maybe, you know, I've heard of one that um, also seems maybe to be about this sort of Matthew Arnold REM despair. Everything feels alienated and I'm either performing as I'm as who I'm not or I'm huddled in a corner feeling like who I am. Doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to end on that point and uh, I hope to God this actually recorded. Otherwise, I've been talking to myself for an hour and a half. Uh, or no, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and I don't know why I would do that because nothing I've said is anything I don't already know. Nonetheless, I like this class. I prefer it in person. I've been teaching these texts forever, but they, 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 they're still alive to me. Uh, the Dover Beach that I read 20 years ago and taught 20 years ago isn't the Dover Beach I read now uh, because I'm not the person I was 20 years ago. I mean, there's certain commonalities, but there's real differences too. And that's the other thing that's great about literature is not only can it be kind of timeless in the sense that, uh, you know, I mean, who's going to look, who's going to use a chemistry textbook written in 1893, for God's sake. I mean, it, you wouldn't even have a periodic table, I don't think. Uh, so it's useless as a chemistry book. And yet this Dorian Gray is, is ageless. It's, it's, it's as or more prescient now. And when it was written, the same, same with Shakespeare. So science as a, a, a as a very much is very cumulative and doesn't make much sense to, uh, unless you're doing the history of science to look at a physics book from the Renaissance or something. Um, it's going to be horribly outdated, as we say. But great art doesn't outdate; 
it, it, um, it ages well, and, and it even changes as we age. Uh, so it's timeless, and it helps us access um, who we are in this, in this vast earth, this vast universe, this vast expanse of time where, we, where indeed we don't live forever. And Matthew Arnold obviously isn't here anymore. Um, and someday neither will we, but in the meantime, we can participate with Arnold through this poem uh, in, in reflections on, on what being alive uh, is like. Okay, I'm gonna figure out how to turn this off uh, and I will see you guys in an open class Wednesday at 11. Uh, roughly speaking, I'm gonna post a taped lecture every week, this is week one, so they'll be going through the, in, in, in accordance with the syllabus. Uh, and I'll have an open class. Most I'm planning on it generally to be Wednesday at 11. If it's if it isn't, I'll put it on announcements. Um, as I said, my email l e o n a r d g a r r y at hotmail dot com is, is another way to reach me. So thanks for listening, and uh, I will see you guys uh, this Wednesday at 11 live synchronous as we say. I mean, it's so funny that time, the, this whole COVID thing has pointed out something I often say, time is a construct. I mean, really, the Earth's just circling, um, you know, as, as this galaxy up here would suggest. And then, I mean, the contrast between this galaxy and the clock, the clock is completely fake, fake news. Who cares what time it is? What does it even mean? Uh, but what time permits is, is, and this is very important in modern life, is it permits synchronization. So if the airplane is flying at seven, taking off at seven or eight in the morning, all of us have to have a pretty good idea what that is. We can't go look at a sundial. We, we need a watch or that, that plane, that airplane can't even do anything. And that happened with trains too, that it, that it had to synchronize the watches. So, and, but all of a sudden here at University of Toronto, I don't have to synchronize appearing in the classroom to give this lecture with you appearing in that same classroom on UTSC campus. I'm not on UTSC campus. I don't know where the heck you are. Right now, there's nobody anywhere until you queue into this. And then you're gonna be in 200 different places or 300, it's about 300 students here. So that's always been true. Um, it, it looks synchronized if you were all in the room with me and I was there and I like that. It takes a lot of it. It takes a little more effort, but I think it's worth it. Um, but it, but that synchronicity is also an illusion. You've all come from 300 places. You're all returning to 300 different places. You're all in 300 different moods, um, as uh, as well as me. Your moods can shift in the course of the one hour lecture from being interested to being bored or from being bored, I prefer this, to being interested. But we'll see how that goes. All right, take it easy. See you Wednesday, 11.